Thank you, thank you, Brother Will Hall. Was she just absolutely phenomenal? Give her another loving, wonderful round of applause. And one last note on Sister Harriet Tubman. She said she could have freed so many more that were enslaved if only they realized they had been enslaved. I want to say congratulations. We've had the first round of a very hard fought election here in the city of Chicago. I am so proud of all of the candidates that came out. It, uh, it takes a lot of effort to show yourself, uh, to make yourself vulnerable, to have lived in a life in a manner where your entire history record can be discussed. And now we have the choice. Any which way this race goes, the people of Chicago win. We have two candidates of our choice. But I want to add one other note to that, because I like to put things in a historical perspective so we can figure out what time it is. And right here in the state of Illinois, we're going to be the bellwether, the canary in the mine. As we go, the nation goes. We have a lieutenant governor. African-American female in the Honorable Juliana Stratton. We have the Honorable Lauren Underwood, a new Congresswoman. We have the Honorable Kimberly Lightfoot, Illinois Senate Majority Leader. We've got the Honorable Carrie Steele, the President of the Cook County Water Reclamation District. We have the Honorable uh, Gordon Booth, the Illinois Deputy House Majority Leader. We have the Honorable Toya Hutchinson, the President of the National Conference of State Legislators. We've got the Honorable Kim Fox, the District Attorney for the, for the Cook County of Illinois. We've got the Honorable Tony Preckwinkle, the Cook County Board President, the largest county in the state of Illinois. We have the Honorable Lori Lightfoot, the leading vote getter for the mayor's race for the city of Chicago. Women and African American are winning across the state of Illinois. My God, now it's time for us to use the power that we've got. And I want men of good conscience and good faith to man up, step up, and stand behind these strong women. We've got ourselves into a terrible mess, and it wasn't women that were leading. Give them a chance to try to figure this mess out that's been created. Did you see the congressional uh, hearings this week of Mr. Cohen? I just have to call him a convicted liar. There is going to be some truth that comes out of his mouth, Reverend Patterson. But if a black man were sitting there, they wouldn't let you forget that he's a convicted liar. And all, all of a sudden, all the things that were racist and despicable, now they bother him before he goes to jail. Mr. Cohen, go sit down, please. The other point I want to make, it was 1968 when the Honorable Shirley Chisholm won for a congressional seat, the first African-American woman in the Congress. She won in 68. She was sworn in in 1969. Thank God it's 50 years later and these women are rising to power. This is a year of jubilee. This is a year of celebration. Women are rising up to their rightful place. And when you see Mrs. Rashida Tlaib, a new congresswoman from the state of Michigan, call Mr. Meadows, the congressman, who made jokes about President Obama ought to go back to Kenya. When this man gets all these mayonnaise tears in his eyes and he's crying because he's called the racist putrid act that he's done, and then he says, I've got family members of color. Mrs. Tlaib, I apologize to you because you should not have to apologize to him. She told the truth on him. Now, on to my point and message for the day. I want to talk about one more bridge to cross. One more bridge to cross. It's that season again where my father, the Reverend Jesse Jackson and John Lewis and Andrew Young and so many others cross ceremonially the Edmund Pettus Bridge in Alabama. 
I have to ask the question, should we forget about that bridge? Wasn't that bridge a long time ago? Before there was Facebook, texting, Twittering, before we could email one another, there's this old bridge down in Alabama. Does it mean anything to us today? Why do the civil rights veterans and the martyrs and the hero go back to Selma every year, in season and out of season. What do I mean by in season and out of season? Well, the in season is when it's election time. The in season is when the politicians come to pick our cotton, to pick our votes, to try to run in front of a black crowd. When it's in season, the politicians come. Their elbows are so sharp. The veteran civil rights leaders can't even get to the front of the line because the politicians come to smile before the cameras, to recount what they've read in a Wikipedia and say, I remember when Negroes and coloreds could not have the right to vote. And they say it with such earnestness. They almost get teared in the eyes. They talk about my history, but then you never see them again. But the old veteran, the old soldiers, those that pick up the cross and the blood-stained banner, something in their soul, in their consciousness. They remember a Jimmy Lee Jackson, a young child that stood in front of his grandmother that got killed. They don't forget. We need our elected officials, but we need our elected officials to represent us, not be appointed to us, and never forget us. As we go back to Selma, and as I was a child, it bothered me to leave here on some Saturdays and not to go play basketball and spend time with my friends, to have to jump in a car and drive down or have to take those long plane rides to go through Atlanta and Dallas to connect, to try to get back to Montgomery and to see the, all the old veterans. And I'm wondering, like, why am I in this room with all these old people? But now as I get older, I can see Reverend Orange, and he's gone. I can see Miss Boynton, and she's gone. I can see the family and the descendants of Jimmy Lee Jackson, and they're dying off and they're gone. I see my father still going down there to keep the memory, to keep it alive. And now so many of our children have no part of their consciousness of that one more bridge that we have to cross. Well, what exactly happened in Selma that we should never forget? After 1619 in Jamestown, 400 years ago, when slavery became a part of the fabric of America, 1619 is the founding of Jamestown and the importation of Africans as slaves, human beings being owned by other human beings. Mind you, the country was not formally signed a declaration, any part of a constitution, until 1776. Almost 160 years of buying and selling our people. Where is this going? You got to understand one more bridge we have to cross. So when Reverend Martin Luther King met with John Lewis and others, and they went back to Selma to cross that bridge. That is when the Voting Rights Act was implemented and signed in 1965. The end of slavery, the abolishment is 1865. We had to fight another 100 years after the end of slavery to have the right to vote. That's Selma. That has everything to do with the Edmund Pettus Bridge. But let's not stop there. You've heard the name Edmund Pettus. Let us be clear, he's Senator Edmund Pettus. Let us be clear, he's also General Edmund Pettus. Let us be clear, he was a Grand Wizard in the Ku Klux Klan in the state of Alabama. General Senator Ku Klux Klansman lawyer Edmund Pettus has a bridge named after him. 
The bridge was named after him 33 years after he died in the 1940s. This wasn't to pick him up to extol the virtues. This was to raise a flag of white supremacy, to have terror put back into the hearts of men and women. This is who General Edmund Pettus is, Grand Wizard, Ku Klux Klansman, going through Route 80 in the Black Belt of Alabama. What did Reverend Martin Luther King and John Lewis and the Freedom Fighters see in Dallas County, Alabama? They saw a county that was majority black 100 years after slavery had legally been abolished, 1865. In 1965, in March, we had 1% of blacks registered in Dallas County. 99% were white. There were all these schemes on voting that was on the books, legislated in, but regulated out. How does that happen? They tell you the voting's on Tuesday, but if you want to vote, you have to come down to the county office. There may be only one county office and you have to drive 30 miles. But when you get there, they say, as Reverend Daddy King, Martin Luther King's father said, he went to register at the county and they told him, you cannot take the elevator. So he went towards the stairs and the stairs said, no Negroes allowed. Other blacks went down to the county to try to register the boat. And one of the judges said, name for me every judge in every county across the state of Alabama. Another judge would tell an African-American, tell me how many bubbles are in a bar of soap. All of these schemes were put in. So we needed federal protection to gain the right to vote. Why is this so important? Because what our president is doing now, they've never forgotten the gains we've made. There is an assault, an attack that's very precise, that's undermining all the gains that we have made, brothers and sisters. He's not crazy, he's wily like a squirrel and a fox. Look at what he does, not what he says. He's undermining our right to vote. My father told me many years ago, he says, we were so excited when we learned we had the right to vote. He says, we jumped and we hit our heads on the ceiling. We saw all the progress and all of our hopes had been realized, only to realize we were so low, we were in the basement when we jumped, we hit our head on the ceiling from the basement. Then the fourth phase of our struggle that Reverend Martin Luther King planted my father here in Chicago to take on after slavery, after Jim Crow and segregation, after gaining the right to vote, where are we now? We need to open up the vaults of prosperity and opportunity for all. We've got more bridges to cross, brothers and sisters. In Alabama, the Edmund Pettus Bridge, it's symbolic of the racial terrorism. Alabama was the leading state of lynching in the nation in the 1900s. So to see ministers get together, teenagers get together, to see comedians get together, to see white Methodist ministers like Reverend James Reed, to see white women like, like Viola, come down to Mississippi and get our brains, brains blown out and being told that she was a nigger lover. We cannot forget God would not be happy. And the same threads of discrimination and racism that you heard about today on school funding and mortgages and access to capital and opportunities, they are still around with us today. GoFundMe should have a policy. You know the financial website that you can make donations to? Either you're open to everyone, but you can't let a man that's accused of crimes have his GoFundMe page taken down and let a man that killed a Laquan McDonald have his GoFundMe page taken up. 
What are the rules? It's been 50 years since Shirley Chisholm became a congresswoman. It's been 50 years since man first walked on the moon. It's been 50 years of us trying to have racial progress. And now we've got a hog in the creek that's sitting up top and everyone has to drink the water of the putrid language, of the violence that's being spewed, of a Mr. Meadows crying on television, talking about don't call me that R word. I've got Negro boys and girls in my family. You're hurting my feelings. Will somebody tell him to man up? Ladies and gentlemen, the average median wealth of the African-American household is 10% of that of the white household. Let us be clear on wealth versus income. Wealth is what you can pass on to your family. Income is the amount of capital you earn on an annual basis. The ball team owners that pays the checks for all of the athletes, they have wealth. That football team, basketball team, baseball team goes to their children. The Pittsburgh Steelers was bought as a game, as a toy for Mr. Rooney's great-grandson. It was a toy. The San Francisco 49ers, it was a gift to the DeBartolo children. The Ricketts family put the money up for their children to buy the Chicago Cubs. These are toys for very wealthy people. But if you take out a Ray Carruthers in Baltimore for abuse, you better do something about the man in San Francisco that just hit his wife. We need one set of rules 50 years later. When we look at transit infrastructure, please do not reduce in Alabama Reverend Martin Luther King fighting the transit system to Rosa Parks sitting on a bus. Mrs. Rosa Parks was 40, 42 years old. She was not an old, bent over, decrepit woman. She was a woman in her height of strength and consciousness. She made an active choice and decision to fight segregation and the slaveocracy. She wanted to make sure that we could also drive the bus, that we could sell tires to the bus, that we could also manufacture the buses, that we could have access to transit routes that would connect us to the unconnected parts of our city. One of the greatest determinants of your access to social mobility is not your education. It's not simply your wealth. A greater predictor of your access and your uprising comes from your accessibility to transportation. When government policies are still going into place, that are gerrymandering, going around our neighborhoods where we don't have places where you can pay and park and take the mass transit to downtown. When our connection buses don't connect in the city and the south suburbs. When we have three transit systems in the state of Illinois that aren't connected, a CTA, a maze, uh, a pace, and we can't have one transfer to get to the county hospital, we've got a problem. When you close down schools that were next to mass transit lines, we have a problem. One more bridge to cross, ladies and gentlemen. It's been 50 years, and we're not going to forget the name of General Ku Klux Klansman, Edmund Pettus. Why did they put his name on that bridge? You need to look at some of these names before you celebrate. Right here in Chicago, in Hyde Park, right down the block from here is Harper's Court. Look up Attorney Harper and see how he wrote the laws of segregation to keep black folks out and created the neighborhood watch so a Negro could not go to school. Look up the names of those putrid racists. Not that we should take them all down. We need to go in the positive. Keep theirs up so we never forget who they are and make sure we start erecting our own to celebrate the victories we won. I'm excited. Right here in the state of Illinois, 
we're going to have one of two women to be the next mayor of this great city, the city of Chicago. We're going to go into detail in the weeks to come. We've got a bridge to cross right here in Chicago. Like that Edmund Pettus Bridge crosses the Alabama River and the Alabama River comes straight up from Mobile all the way on up into Tennessee. That Alabama River, that was the heart of the production of cotton and the selling of African Americans. That same river where the last slave ship to have been known to have come into the United States in America. We were to have outlawed slavery in 1807 on the importation of Africans. They said it was a bet, it was a wager, where the gentleman came and went and got some more slaves. The last slave ship was the slave ship called Clotilda that came into the port in Mobile, Alabama, and the blacks went into Africa town right there in Mobile. That's the bridge that crosses for the Edmund Pettus Bridge. That same bridge, we're right here in Chicago. We've got a Chicago River that separates a north side from a south side. Right here in Chicago, we've got a Chicago River that makes the life expectancy 20 years longer on the north side versus the south side. We've got a river that the next mayor has to cross to bring the entire city together.